Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with episode 1050 of Ask Dave. This is, I think, only the second sponsored video that I've ever done. And the sponsor for this video is Mark Chenard, who owns Cubex Quads and another company called Tenadyne. Cubex manufactures cubicle quads. Tenadyne makes log periodics. Now, this all came about because my Ask Dave column in QST talked about the gain of the cubicle quad versus a hex beam. I said that I did not know of any manufacturers of cubicle quads. Well, that of course generated some comments. It turns out that there are two providers worldwide of cubicle quads that I know of. One is in Spain, and this video is devoted to the one in the USA. Cubex was acquired a few years ago by Mark Chenard, K5YAC, who moved the business from its then location, Alto, Michigan, to Collinsville, Oklahoma. We will go through a lot of examples that Mark has provided to try to understand a little bit about the cubicle quad. Now, most hams who have gain antennas atop a tower have yagis. Cubicle quads are rather bigger in some regards. Common wisdom states that a cubicle quad performs about as if it were a yagi with one more element. In other words, these can be powerful antennas. Mark got in touch with me after my column came out in the December QST. He sent me lots of pictures. We're going to concentrate first on the website for Cubex Quads. Now, fair warning, Cubex Quads should come up immediately and stay up. If you see a page like this, immediately close the window and close the browser and try again. If you click on the malware, you will be led down a rabbit hole. So go back and try again. If you do get to the correct website, it's really worth browsing. They make cubicle quads from 40 meters down to 70 centimeters. Now, the 40 meter quad is a rarity because it's so large, but HF quads for 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meters are more common. I point out that every quad is made to order. Mark would actually prefer to hear from you over the phone so he can ask you questions to make sure he understands your needs and schedule your build. Now, I said many times that the basic antenna is a dipole. We can work our way up from a dipole to a loop. A dipole is a half wavelength long, but you can arrange it so that if you have a full wavelength loop of wire, that will work as well. This is called a loop antenna. These are often hung vertically, like in a tree. Now, and here's the great leap, just as you can take several dipoles and put them on a boom with appropriate adjustments and lengths, we have a Yagi. Okay, we can do the same thing with loops. Now, one might ask, why go to all that trouble to make a bunch of loops when you can just make a Yagi. Well, the feedback I get is that the loops are quieter, meaning reduced uh, QRN or noise, and an array of these loops called a cubicle quad actually provides a bit more gain than a comparable Yagi. Years ago, when hams tended to make their own antennas, even Yagis, quads were cheaper to make. The problem was their innate fragility. The spreaders for the wires were traditionally made from bamboo poles, and the attachment of the bamboo poles to the boom was often flimsy. These antennas often came down in the first severe storm. Gradually, cubicle quads became more rare. Well, enter Cubex. The spreaders for the wire are no longer bamboo, they're fiberglass. And just like a fiberglass fishing rod, you can bend these extensively in a storm and they will just bounce back. 
Furthermore, the attachment of the spreaders to the mast is done with cast aluminum arms that are then milled to fit the boom. For their larger antennas, the boom can be as big as three inches in diameter. These are very sturdy antennas. They have solved two problems. One, the fragility of the spreaders and the connection to the boom. Now, just like Yagi's, people experiment with optimum spacing, as shown in this drawing from the Antenna Book, 23rd edition. A little about the history of Cubex. It started in Altadena, California. Cubex founder Carl Sharping, W6KWF, shown in this picture, designed the HF quads. Norm Alexander, W4QN, designed the VHF slash UHF quads. Here are some pictures of early advertisements <laughs> before people actually had real fonts. Note that the address 3322 Tanya Avenue is currently a residential dwelling. With later ads, they show up with a P.O. box in Altadena, California, a bit east of north of downtown Los Angeles. They also made 11-meter quads. One of the reasons for this was because at one time, the 11-meter band was a ham band. Now, Cubex still makes these for those who enjoy CB. Here's a picture of the old factory from the 1960s. This is a lovely part of town, don't you think? But if you look in the middle, you can see the name Cubex. And this was the place where they built those quads. Now, fast forward to the present. Here is the owner of both Cubex Quads and Tenadyne. Tenadyne is another company that makes log periodics, which are extremely wideband antennas and should be the subject of another video. Here he is with his son Tyler, W5EAA, at a local ham fest. The two work together to provide the cubical quads. This is a VHF quad here, and up here you can just see the edge of the log periodic. Here is Tyler using a milling machine to make the parts. They make everything in their shop. Here is their storage container for various fiberglass separators. This is their factory, where you can see their big giant cubicle quad atop a sturdy retractable tower. Their factory happens to double as an aircraft hangar, as both are into flying. I'm surprised how many hams are also licensed pilots. If you look inside, you can see part of the production department. Here are all the different parts and pieces that are assembled. This gives you a picture of some of the parts and pieces that are used in the assembly of the quads. They'll give you all the pieces and all the hardware. Note how it's laid out so each type of hardware is separate. These little things right here are called nylock nuts. Once you put these things on, they don't back off by themselves. The very different pieces are all shipped like this to you. All the antenna elements are very carefully rolled up and labeled. What you want to do with these is not just pull wire out of them, but rather unroll them. Take one of the ends and have someone hold it while you walk backwards unrolling this thing, and that keeps the wire from developing a twist or kinks. Here's an example of some of the high quality materials they use. This example shows DX Engineering's coax and connectors. Here's how they attach. These are very sturdy attachments that will not come apart. They also provide, of course, all the instructions you need. This is a VHF UHF quad with the two antennas running in parallel on a common boom and that way uh, you can get quite a bit of directionality. Note that it's oriented in the diamond shape. This right here is the 70 centimeter antenna so you can use this if you want to work satellites. Note down here is the feed point for two meters, and here is the feed point for 70 centimeters. I just want to mention in passing that directionality in an antenna is a double-edged sword. If you are pointed at the person that you are talking to, you can get great communications. However, if you're just searching for DX, it's often best to start with the vertical until you hear the DX, 
then rotate your directional antenna to where the DX is and then make the antenna switch. One thing you have to consider on your tower is that the tower not only has to be strong enough to hold the wind loading of these things, which are about five square feet of wind load. Another thing you need is a tower that won't twist because when you stop rotating your antenna, the brakes go against the mast. Well, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction which goes for any rotatable antenna. When the brake is holding the antenna against the mast, there is still torque in the antenna. This can try to twist the tower. Note the towers are rated for twist as well as the total amount of load that they can handle. Let's look at this antenna, the Cubex Mark IV Quad, which is in southern Norway. It has uniform spacing of the various elements from a length point of view. But from an electrical point of view, it's a different wavelength spacing for each band. Now, this is a time-honored way of doing it. Now, here's an old Yagi. It's called an A3 and is a venerable antenna which is still sold to this day. Now, with the advent of computers, people are playing with the spacing of the various elements in Yagis to get more out of them. However, a design in which all the elements are the same length apart is a bit of a compromise. In the ARRL Antenna Handbook, this drawing shows a cubical quad where element spacing is taken into account. Note that this is a hypothetical antenna. In the next several pictures, Cubex owner Mark Chenard is replacing his hex beam with a large four element cubical quad for 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meters. I just zoomed in on this so you can actually see what's going on. This right here is the driven element. You can tell because you see that fed by the coax. He decided to run separate coax all the way to the ground rather than putting a relay box up at the top because if the relay box were to go bad, he would have to climb the tower. However, if he brought all five coax lengths to the ground, he could service the relay box at the bottom. Now, what are the drawbacks of cubical quads? They are made of wire, and in some parts of the country, they get ice storms. This kind of thing can happen. So here is a picture of why they picked those bendy fiberglass spreaders. When the ice finally melted, the antenna sprang back to normal. I've had a similar thing happen to my hex beam. Here's another example of a quad that's been in an ice storm. Here's what it looked like as it was melting the ice, and then here's what it looked like after the ice melted. Here's a little bit about Mark's journey to put up his own quad. The first thing to do is to remove the hex beam. He wants to use the same tower. Now, over here you can see the completed quad with the big powerful spreaders and the fiberglass antenna parts. Now, no, the antenna comes as a kind of a kit. You have to put it together. This is not a one afternoon project, nor is it a project for just one person. Here they are building the quad right under the self-supporting tower. The fact that it is self-supporting really removes the problem of having guy wires in the way. Let's keep looking at Mark's antenna. He's got it all done all right, but he has decided after looking at it that he is going to take the end pieces off to make things easier to handle. That's because it's very unwieldy when you're trying to hold it up there. You can see the middle part where it's connected to the mast. This is the boom, the elements are the wire elements, and the non-conducting fiberglass for the separators. Here he is up attaching that end piece so that he can get everything properly stretched out. He then attaches the other end piece. This element right here is the driven element. You can see the coax coming out of each feed point. Now, Mark, who is sponsoring this video, asked me to mention the log periodic antennas as well. This is a very different type of antenna. It's not a Yagi. Each one of these elements is a driven element. It has extremely broad frequency capability. Mark makes log periodic antennas that can cover from 10 megahertz to 30 megahertz. 
although many of these antennas are sold to organizations that need the frequency flexibility, a good number of these are purchased by hams. Mark and Tyler, thank you for sponsoring this episode of Ask Dave. I've put your website address in the text below so people can go to it quickly. If you want to know more, give Mark a phone call. They're usually out in that hangar working on orders. Your quad will be custom built, so there may be a short wait depending on the model. You will have to put up a tower to handle an HF quad. However, smaller UHF VHF models can be supported on a sturdy mast. Ask for the tower requirements and then get the tower that will do that. There are towers that will handle the wind load, but will not handle the twisting factor, so you will end up having to put up like a three element quad or something like that to keep the rotation break from twisting the tower. Note that if you have the right tower for these, a cubical quad has about the same gain as a Yagi that has an additional element. In other words, a four element quad is equivalent to a five element Yagi, give or take a few dB. But quads are slightly more compact on a shorter boom than comparable Yagis. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed it. And I want to thank Mark and Tyler for their sponsorship of this video. I hope you had a chance to learn a lot about cubicle quads. We don't hear much about them in ham radio, but if you run in DX circles or contesting circles, there are people who swear by them. And there you have it. Until we next meet, 73.